Berquist? Here. Mr. Tozer? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Steiger? Present. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Special reports, Mr. Lauer. Actually, it's approve the minutes. Oh, that's what we do. Yes, indeed. Approve the minutes. So uh, moved. Second. Uh, discussion in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now special reports. Well, I just wanted to update council on a couple things. One, in your docket is a, um, a memo from uh, Richard Easton, the uh, chairman of the library board. And um, I would agree with Mr. Easton's uh, assessment about uh, the accomplishments of the library uh, staff in terms of being able to open the library back up. What he is suggesting and what the library staff is, is uh, recommending is that they continue on their modified schedule, which um, means their, uh, their uh, days uh, open Monday through Friday are, are shortened from what they would normally be. And it's their desire to continue that, to doing that for um, uh, the next several weeks um, as they see what's happening with um, the, the situation within the schools. Um, the one thing I will say about the Peters Township Library is that um, they have been open and offering more services than uh, any of the libraries in the surrounding communities, and they're to be commended for that. So um, it's, unless council tells me otherwise, um, I think we ought to be following the recommendation from the library board. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about with the sports Excuse program. Go ahead. Just, so to clarify that. Normally after Labor Day, they open on Sunday. They are not. saying maintain the exact same schedule until we reevaluate it yes. potentially in October? Yes, I would think sometime in the in the first nine weeks of school, we're gonna look at this and, and decide what we wanna do. I think that, I yeah. personally think that's reasonable. Yeah. The, okay. other, the other item that I wanted to talk about are the youth sports programs. You know, um, as we discussed very briefly at the last meeting, um, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health has provided some guidance on this and with a recommendation. The Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association uh, has chosen to go ahead with their sports programs. Um, the other thing that I think um, uh, to keep in mind is, you know, in the case of Peters Township, the decision was made to send all the kids back to school. Um, and while some kids, uh, some families have chosen to have remote learning, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of uh, students in Peters Township are attending schools. Um, I know the, the youth uh, athletic as, uh, associations in, in Peters Township's preference is to play this fall and to do it under uh, a modified set of rules that, that addresses the concerns with COVID. Um, the sports associations that have operated throughout the summer have been able to do that successfully. So I think as long as schools in session and interscholastic athletics are, are playing games, I think we should follow that model and encourage the associations to do it in a safe way, so. Agreed. Do we have all of the safety plans from the Recreational Sports Association? All of the ones that are, are currently active and those that are gonna have fall programs, that's a requirement before they move ahead. Okay, thank you. I think that makes sense. Okay, anything else under special? No. All right, audience comments. Um, we have been following a plan for the duration of the uh, COVID pandemic so far of having people submit their comments in writing. We have been read them into the record, acknowledged them. Uh, we made a, an exception this evening to have people physically present for the first time. Um, we have a large number of people here, obviously, for <clears throat> the same topic. And uh, I would, when we get to that point, uh, I would ask that everybody who chooses to speak, please limit your com comments uh, as much as you can. We have five minutes, but if you don't have to take that, please don't. 
Um, if somebody has made the comment before, we hear, we understand, it doesn't have to be made again. Uh, you know, making it several times doesn't make it any clearer or emphasize it any more for us. Um, and uh, <clears throat> before we get to that part, there is one written comment that is not represented here tonight, which is from um, Barbara Sauter with regard to parking on the, in the park. And it just says, I've been attending con concerts in Petersburg Park. Uh, since they began, people have always parked on the safe grassy areas. On August 12th, I was safely parked in a grassy area, received a parking ticket. Um, there were no signs prohibiting parking in sight since this has never been an issue before. I feel it is unfair to issue fines <clears throat> without signage and warning. I appreciate your attention in this matter. Thank you. Well, there's plenty of signs that say don't park on the garage. Yeah, yeah, there, 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 there's a plethora of signs <laughs> inside yeah. of the park. You say there's no, yeah. no shortage of those. And there was plenty of parking available that yeah. night because I was there. Um, I'd have to walk a little bit. We have, we have a number of letters from people with regard to the, uh, the school uh, busing issue. Um, I would like to acknowledge these letters. I will read the, the names of the people from whom the letters come. Uh, some of you may be here this evening. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but we will make these letters part of the record. Uh, I don't really think we need to read all of the letters, but they will be part of the record. So I have a letter from um, Mr. Stephen Simcoe, I have a letter from Samantha McVicker, I have a letter from Dr. Gogburn, I have a letter from Ron Selva, I have a letter from, this is an additional letter I guess from Ron Selva, um, Gregory McVicker, and um, Chuck and Nancy Morial. Um, those letters will be part of the record if those people are here and wish to speak, please do so. But as I said, um, if, if you know somebody has already made the comment, we don't need to make it again, uh, please keep your remarks brief. So with that, who would like to be our first speaker? Please. Uh, state your name and address, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patrick Ogburn and I'm at 101 Highview Drive. Um, and as you've already mentioned, I did submit a letter. I won't try to recount everything that's in the letter, but I'd like to just uh, make a couple of brief summary comments in reference to the main points. Um, so a lot of the detail is in there, but fundamentally the, the issue in question is the use of um, Orchard Highlands as a throughway for buses from McMurray Elementary. And, um, it's an issue that's been um, addressed in the township more than once when the school was built in 93 and then again in 2009. There was a question about sending buses through. I'm not certain that it reached the town council in every case, but certainly with the uh, school board in 2009 when I was here. And in both cases, those, the decision was made not to do it, fundamentally for safety reasons, because the roads, are such that it's unsafe to send a large number of buses through the neighborhood. They're narrow, there are some blind corners. Personally, when I'm driving through the neighborhood in a, a small sedan, I go 15 miles, I'm sorry, 20 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone just because I don't feel it's safe to go faster. And, it, and sending buses through there is even more of an issue in that regard. And by my observation, buses generally don't go less than 25 miles an hour, um, particularly when they're rushed. And the, re the other reason why we're concerned about the safety is that a lot of people walk in our neighborhood. We're in close proximity to the town center with the library, municipal, well, right here. We walked to the meeting today. So um, students walk to McMurray Elementary, students walk to the middle school, and so there's a lot of foot traffic in our neighborhood. And um, that makes it worse. And just to illustrate my point, um, I have a very, very uh, vivid memory when I was 14 years old getting on the school bus in high school and we were waiting as the kids were waiting today at elementary to leave and as the green light was given, our bus went over a pronounced bump. 
that was my friend, Jonathan Leggett. And I know that the safety hazards around loading buses are not unknown to anyone, and I know we take measures to prevent that. But what we've done by sending the buses through our school, I'm mean, sorry, through our neighborhood, is we've extended that danger zone where we're mixing buses with pedestrians. It didn't have to happen that way. And uh, those, are, those are my main points. I think there are other solutions which are pre we'd, we'd like to be engaged in the solution to, that, to the problems that, we're being, that are being faced right now, which we think are exactly the same as they were in 2009, maybe differ somewhat in magnitude, but the issue is the same, and that's congestion at the school and on McMurray Road. Thank you. Thank you. Next. State your name and address, please. Hi, Stephen Simcoe, 119 Meadowbrook Circle. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak about this. This is um, obviously a topic that is a lot of people in our neighborhood are very passionate about and feel um, pretty upset about. Um, we understand that the decision to run the buses through our neighborhood was under the premise of addressing traffic congestion. Um, I have a, I have 120 signatures on a petition here from the residents of our neighborhood, and I'd be willing to give you a copy at the, at the end. Um, a lot of people don't see it that way. Uh, we'd like to, to know was a, a traffic study done in advance of making this decision, which I'm assuming that it wasn't because school wasn't in session and it would be impossible to assess what the, the challenges would be. Um, but 11 years ago, we had the same discussion. It was the same issues. It was traffic congestion. It was determined back then, based on road width, based on no sidewalks and pedestrian traffic, that the superintendent of the school came and observed it and dictated that, no, this is an unsafe condition. Nothing's changed. It's still the same issues as it was 11 years ago. Um, I guess another point that I wanted to make was, I, I think a lot of our town, our neighborhood was disappointed that we were not engaged and part of a conversation prior to receiving a letter saying that this was mandated. It would have been nice to have had the opportunity to come and speak with you and talk about other options that were on the table before it just being imposed. Um, Another thing that has not changed is the school board has taken no action to resolve this known issue since the school was open in 93 to the same issue in 2009. It's the same issues. Nothing physically has been done to address the issue. So we're a little disappointed that we keep on going back to a solution that has already been deemed to be unsafe and has not moved forward. I'm sorry, could you clarify what you mean by that? By what? Uh, uh. The issues that the school board has not addressed. Well, it's, it's the traffic congestion. Has the school board physically done? Uh, not in your plan, but no, no. Okay, I'm no, sorry. I think I think no, the school board the school board could have done a little more in terms of studies. I know that we're going to talk about the Bell Avenue option. At least that's one I consider to be uh, a viable option. You have walkers that come from that school, bus riders that come from that school, and uh, parent drivers. Why do we not let the, but the, uh, the walkers out and the school bus children at the same time? The walkers exit out Orchard High, uh, out Meadowbrook Circle, the bus riders could be loaded and then exited out McMurray Drive and have a cop let the buses go. Then you can control the parents going in. Right now, from what I'm hearing, it's a little bit of chaos up there and there's parents driving in amongst the buses and it seems to be an out of control situation that unfortunately has now become a problem for my neighborhood because we couldn't get the problem under control on the school property and with the options that are available. We could open up the bus garage, that gate adjacent to the school, run parents up that way. Parents that want to make a right turn, only right turn parents, go up that way. If you want to make a left turn, go down McMurray Drive. A cop will be there to help you make that left turn. The buses are, are already gone. So now you have cars leaving, and you have cops helping them get out, and you've addressed the traffic issue. I don't know why we came to, to the solution that running buses through, nine buses through 
our neighborhood was going to alleviate traffic congestion. Um, so we're a little disappointed that this seems to be made uh, out of the basis of convenience and at no point has anybody said that it's a matter of convenience. It's every letter that you've gotten, I'm sure you'll read, is somebody talking about safety. It's safety, safety, safety. It's always been that way. 20 foot road, wide foot wide roads. I mean, you're going from curb to curb and that's 20 feet. It's that's standard actually. In a residential neighborhood? Yeah, that, you know, there are various widths of roads in Peter Township um, and school buses travel in various subdivisions, including subdivisions that have street widths that are the same as what you have in your, your plan. All right. I know my time's about to run out, but can I just finish the last sure. statement of thought to compensate for the conversations that we had? Um, 11 years ago, as well, when the school was built, we entered a kind of an agreement, an understanding that all parties realized that it is an unsafe plan of action and the gate would be for emergency vehicles only. Your actions are breaking that agreement. You have been advised multiple times on the safety issues, which has already been decided by the school board 11 years ago that this is a safety issue. It is now not a question of if something happens, but when something happens, you, you've been advised that it's a safety issue and don't want to like look at it as a, a negligent thing, but we've had this conversation now and I, I would really like for you to look at it closer and see if there's another option that can alleviate the buses from going through our neighborhood because we strongly feel the safety issues are something that are very important to their, our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, I'm Samantha McVicker, 115 Ridgeview Drive. I um, <clears throat> obviously echo the sentiments of those who came before me and I won't repeat those to you, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of insight into what did happen today when they in fact brought these buses through our neighborhood. First off, uh, my daughter is a fourth grader at McMurray. She's quite petite, definitely would not be seen over a bus. Um, and so obviously that was a, a grave concern. So I walked up to the end of our street so that I could see her walking towards me. As I walked up, a police officer, who we would think would be there to keep them safe, came barreling down the street right at my kid and the group of people who was at the end of the road coming through. I have a photo. Um, to ask them if they lived there, which I understand came from the fact that some of us did express concern about people driving into our neighborhood and using it as a way to pick up their kids when they didn't live there, but not the right course of action. I think we can all agree. Um, secondarily, one of my neighbors, um, who if I might, may say is, is quite soft-spoken, um, posted this. She had her car parked in front of her home. The police officer threatened to tow their van, which was legally parked in front of their house, if they didn't move it. She asked what code it was violating and was told that if he had to look it up, he would tow it, and that he was told by Mr. Lauer to tow any vehicles that were not moved. Well, that would be incorrect. I don't deny that, but I'm just <laughs> telling you what was said. That would be incorrect. And obviously, I mean, there are no signs telling us we aren't allowed to park there. It's a public street. We all know we aren't allowed to park from 2 to 6, but it wasn't 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so I, I just would ask that you please revisit this. I am uh, deeply upset that we weren't given the opportunity to discuss it with you beforehand. Um, and I just, I know these are extenuating circumstances, but my other request would be that we are given some sort of uh, promise that this is in fact a temporary fix to a temporary problem, and that this is not something I, that we're I looking believe, to keep that I way. think we were clear. The on motion our, was, and yeah. I think Mr. Coase made it, that uh, it would only be for the current school year. Okay. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. I do appreciate that. Um, but again, I, I would appreciate it if you would revisit it and if any of you would like to come see what it is like when these nine or 10, I'm not sure what ended up coming through. We've heard both numbers. Buses come through. I would welcome you. Yeah. But, but if I can just- I have a question for you. 
Sure. What was it like after school? Well, that's when this is happening. Uh, it's after it's school. school. This is after school. This is only after mm -hmm. school. There, are, there yes. are nine buses that exit after school. And, and interestingly, if, and if I, I and if, just the afternoon. Right. And and if I can, you know, <coughs> the motion, in fact, was as what you said. But what the thing that I said at the time, and and we intend to do, is to monitor the situation and work with the school district to understand what's, what's happening there. Um, if you were there um, this morning when school came into session, um, at most of the schools, um, things worked out. The high school is always backed up. Uh, but um, the exception to that was this school. And the reason why that is, there's almost 900 kids going to that school and half of the parents have decided that for their children that they would prefer to drop them off. So there are 400 and some cars that are coming in. So if you would have been there this morning, what you would have discovered that East McMurray Road was stopped. The doors of the school did not open to 8.30. People already by quarter after eight were backed onto East McMurray Road. And so we had a, what I believe to be an unsafe situation. The afternoon was equally challenged. Um, there are so many cars coming in that they can't even get the buses into the position to pick up the kids. So school lets out at 3.30, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, school buses were not headed back out, um, the ones that head towards East McMurray Road until five till four. So um, even this afternoon, I was in touch with uh, Tracy. Uh, she's the lady who uh, is the school bus coordinator. The school district is already um, going to tweak what they're doing over there to try to address this. One of the things that, uh, that I have been very clear with the school district is that from my perspective, if the bus is passing through the neighborhood, solve a problem then that's something that, that I think we should be doing. But if it doesn't solve a problem, if in fact all of the buses are so tied up that it makes no difference that they exit out in that direction, then we ought not to do that. So what we intend to do with all of the school locations is to spend this first week looking at them and analyzing them to find out what makes sense in the case of each of them, including the situation here. So uh, what occurred at McMurray Elementary cannot be the norm. It, we, we cannot go a school year with with traffic like that. It's it's not safe for anybody. So just so you were there today when the buses exited? Yes. I'm trying to under, just understand nine buses, did it take an hour? For the um, buses to go through the neighborhood, did it take 10 minutes? Well, I will tell you that what happened today would definitely not be the norm, I don't think. I mean, I suspect it was because it was the first yeah. day, but maybe it's just because of the way that the traffic is flowing up there. Um, the buses did not physically come through our neighborhood today until 4 o'clock. Yes. So by the time they came through today, nobody was anywhere. Our kids were long gone because they yes. walk and they okay. were home. <laughs> but that is not how it. Well, I'm, I'm just again trying it. to understand the time. Yeah, yeah. that's not um, how it would typically. I mean, I understand be. the safety. I'm completely sure. on board. I'm just trying to understand yeah. if we're only talking 15 minutes of time. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, you know, we could keep kids off the roads at that time. Um, we yeah. can't keep our. The, I guess the, the biggest issue, and I, I totally understand what you're saying, because and and so I walk that neighborhood a lot, and I don't point. see a lot of kids on the on the street. There are at that time of day, because of the fact that buses do not come into our neighborhood. Yeah. You have the kids who are walking from McMurray. Right. And you also have at the front of our neighborhood, the kids who get off the bus from Bower Hill, get off on Bebo. Okay. And so they are either walking or their parents pick them up if they're little, you know, I mean, they're kindergarten to third graders and some of them live three quarters of a mile up the road. So oftentimes there are certainly cars parked there of people who live in our neighborhood picking up their children. Um, and so, yes, I suppose if, for, like, if we knew this exact 15 minute increment, you could keep people off the road, which you can't keep the kids off the road who are coming home for sure okay. and that's that's Thank what you. 
That's what should happen if the buses coming through our neighborhood help the situation because they should be coming through right at the same time that all of these other things are happening. As I recall, we did have some conversation when we were considering this about, hey, it's nine school buses. It can't take more than 10 or 15 minutes for them to exit through the neighborhood. Because this is an emergency. I know you don't think it's an emergency, another, but, you know, it another is. Thing the other thing about the situation with Power Hill, again, Today was not normal, right. but if Bower Hill dismissal was actually at the same time as the dismissal from the school, so what you would assume would happen, because Bower Hill is a distance away, that these buses would be out of this neighborhood before the buses from Bower Hill. Okay came by, but again, it's you not, can't go by what happened today. Well, I, I, to, yeah. to that point, I will tell you two things. Um, the bus from Bower Hill is to arrive at our neighborhood at 342. Yeah. Is that correct? And we were told by Dr. French that our kids would be given a 15 minute window to walk home. So that puts them there at the same time. Um, and I was going to say something else, Mr. Berquist, to something you said, but I can't remember what it was. Um, Me? Yeah, I, it was when you said, I know you don't think this hey, is I don't remember either. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 66 and you're not. <laughs> that I am not. Um, Could I just ask you. a clarifying question? Sure. When this came to council from the school board, personally, I took it as a recommendation because they had deliberated on the options. So are you saying, you say that we didn't ask you about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I guess my presumption was that you all knew this was happening because the school board was discussing it, but you're telling me that's not the case? No. I, I still have this, been notified. I, I have to say that I, I misunderstood that completely. After the decision was made. And the only people that notified us was the township. Yeah. This, this was a request from the school district's administration to the township. So, it, so perhaps that was my misunderstanding that they had actually evaluated and talked with residents. No, the notification came from the township. No, I understand. Well, I'm saying I don't think we had a considerable amount of time between we were no asked no. that in our meeting. If we would have delayed it to tonight's right. meeting, school started today. In, in the town, you know, from, from my perspective, from the manager's office perspective, um, this history that they speak of with regard to concern about access, and this is not something new. I would agree with them. This has been a concern in that neighborhood. I do think what you're dealing with right now is something that's truly extraordinary. There has not been anything like this that has caused this kind of kind of problem with traffic. Yeah, we have understood that maybe over half of the kids that were riding buses would no longer do that and they would be vehicles that their parents would be driving. And that's exactly what happened today. And in the afternoon was very difficult because matching parents with kids after school when there are so many, um, you had you had cars everywhere. It was not okay. All right, thank you. Yep. I'm Julie Ogburn, 101 Highview Drive. And um, I had a, an extensive conversation with Lisa Anderson today while waiting, she's on the school board, while waiting at the, at the gate. And um, one of the things that is at play here is, and, and Dr. French said it when our husbands went to the school board to discuss it, they discussed the options for four months, she said, and weighed all of those and never included us in the conversation. And they said they were aware of the issues, but they made a decision based on this emergency basis and th thought that we could, for 10 minutes, withstand the inconvenience of having 10 buses come through our neighborhood. However, when I talked to Lisa Anderson today, and she was watching the buses speed out of the back exit, and there were kids our, a lot of our driveways are blind, and we have a lot of little kids, and they just ride their bikes because this is a walking and riding neighborhood. They've never had 
we don't even buses don't even come in our neighborhood to pick up the kids at all so it's not a typical one where you have one bus coming through and picking up a bunch of kids to go to school there are never buses in our neighborhood except for one little small bus that picks up uh, a school a child for a school for the blind so um, there's a lot of bushes near the exits for the driveways you would not be able to see a child if they were riding a bike or a scooter or in a, and about 50 percent of the kids in our neighborhood are doing virtual learning so they're done with their schoolwork way before those buses get are on the road and they're out playing i'm not sure that you could verify that they won't be on the road and i don't think four cops in our neighborhood every day saying everybody needs to be off the road is going to ensure that nothing happens to a child. In addition, in talking to Lisa, she said that when they arranged the pickup times, they, they specifically asked parents to drive their children in order to minimize the number of children on the buses. So now, my high school son said, there's nobody on the bus. There were like five kids on the bus, but everybody is driving their kids mm -hmm. because Peters Township has a lot of really concerned parents. And when you tell them there's an emergency, we need you to drive your kids, 90% of them are gonna drive their kids, which is where we are now. And as we watch those buses come out of the exit, most of them were not even, I mean, they were sparsely populated. So we've got nine buses sparsely populated a boatload of parents on mcmurray and what lisa said is they were assured in in directing we'll address this with the school board of course but she said in directing the traffic they were and the, they were led to believe that the younger children should be picked up second a lot of parents have multiple kids right they have the middle school they have mcmurray they have to go to pv and bower hill so they were instructed that the younger children could stay longer at Bower Hill and PV. So the parents should pick up, and this is what they told the parents, pick up McMurray first, then go to Bower Hill and PV. You wanna talk about a hornet's nest, because if you get stuck at McMurray and you can't pick up your little baby kindergartner or first grader at Bower Hill and PV, you're gonna be really, really mad. But if they were to pick up those elementary school kids the younger ones first, and then come to Bower Hill, I mean to McMurray, and ensure that the buses are leave first, so the kids on buses leave earlier, parents are coming to pick up their kids at McMurray later, those kids are held, they're a little bit older, they're able to be held a little easier, and, um, and from what I understand, the problem that we were trying to resolve by having parents drive has resulted in kids being packed into hallways close together in just as dangerous a, a position as they would be if they were on a bus together. But that's he neither here nor there. Our take from the neighborhood is, if you're in a car and you're on McMurray Road, you're insulated from harm. You might get in an accident, but you have a car around you if you're in our neighborhood and you're a small child and a bus and a bunch of buses are barreling through, you aren't insulated. So it's, it's inconvenient for those parents to have to wait on McMurray. And I get it, it's totally nuts. And I watch the traffic, the bus, the, the cars literally going around the buses trying to get out like crazy people. And what I'm saying is, they're in their car and they're gonna be safe. But we're not, our kids are not in a car and they're not gonna be but safe. But the only thing I wanna point out is that what you have to understand about East McMurray Road, police, ambulance, and fire are all located on that. So when this is backed up and nothing is moving at all, you can't get an ambulance out, you can't respond with the police department or the fire department. That's why keeping East McMurray Road but it wasn't clear. clear. Oh, it wasn't. I'm agreeing <laughs> you. It's a problem. It, yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I mean, my take on it is picking up those younger kids first, not allowing parents into McMurray until after the buses are gone might be a far better solution. And then letting this some parents go out, Bell, some parents go out the other way. Than, than what occurred today. And it, and it also preserves okay. the safety okay. of our neighborhood. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Anybody else?
anybody else? Well, it sounds like we have one day's worth of experience and a very large logistics problem. Um, I think that the school board and township have a lot to look at here. Uh, I hope that you know people don't make up their minds. This is good, bad, or indifferent based on one day's of experience. You know, we we hear your your issues for sure, um, but I think that. You know, that, that when you try and move a large number of people, particularly small children, uh, from, a, from, you know, multiple schools, recognizing that parents have children in multiple schools, um, we need to, you know, get the school board thinking about, you know, release times and, and how, you know, how that might be adjusted and how people might work out where the buses <clears throat> go. I mean, I don't honestly understand the concept of suggesting that the buses be as empty as possible. I mean, I understand not wanting to get people near each other, but if you're going to run buses, you know, and have people on them, and if, if the idea is not to have people on the buses, then why are we running buses? So, um, you know, something that, that, you know, we're not going to solve here tonight. But we do hear you, and we appreciate your coming, and we definitely hear the, the discussion. So. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, okay, moving on. Hey, uh, can I just say something, Paul? I think that you know we probably should put this issue on the next several agendas. Oh. Um, just, and I, I just in case yeah. you know some issue crops up and we right. have to deal with it. Um, well, I would think in two weeks' time we should have a good idea. Of well, that's what, what I'm saying. At least what maybe put it on the next agenda to see mm -hmm. if, if what's going on. It just seems to me that there's a lot of things that could be done. Unfortunately, it's not within our bailiwick. It's more of a school board issue. Um, but I, I think that hopefully that they're going to be as responsive as we usually are to issues in the township. Yeah, so I think that to make it a special report, I, I, I can do that. The, the other thing I would offer is if there's someone who is has an email address that I can correspond with and they can share information as I get it. I, I'm more than happy to do that as well. well so I'm sure it's not lost on the school board that this process didn't work. Um, I'm sure it didn't work. Yeah. No. Pardon me? The today didn't work. <coughs> that today yes. didn't work. This yeah. process with the timing probably wasn't the best answer. Well, I, th I think that the school board will, will certainly uh, Look at their hand, and, and you know, and if there's things that they can do, if we can be a party to solving the problem, we'll, you know, we'll do what the township can do. So, again, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for clarifying. You know, sorry, welcome to stay for the rest of the exciting yeah, meeting. See, see, see what we do here. Generally speaking, there's an exodus at this point. Um, okay, uh, there is no unfinished business. Uh, new business. First item is appointment of a member to the Peters Township Sanitary Authority. Um, Mr. Berquist. Uh, I make a motion that we appoint um, Joe Wells. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Well, I would like to say that both candidates were on stand. They were. Absolutely. Uh, very, very good. Uh, okay, uh, for Joe Wells, uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, coordinating. All righty. Take care of that. Send it. Send me an email. Um, approval for recording purposes of Tomco lot consolidation plan number one. Mr. So, Chairman, I'll make a motion. I've review this. I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, consolidation plan subject to the Peters Creek Sanitary Authority approval. Second. Second. Okay, any other discussion? No. Nope. In favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, approval for recording purposes the waterfall plan phase one. The shown on drawings prepared by uh, Gales and Associates dated July 29. I mean, whoa, 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 did we vote on the... Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yeah. The other guy got it. Who voted for you? Mr. What's Wells. that? Who voted your vote? Oh, okay. <laughs> God, I go to the bathroom in the world changes. <laughs> yeah. Just keep it old things. Okay. So, I mean, th this is a relatively simple subdivision. There are currently four lots, and they're being reconfigured into three lots. All of them are, are uh, conforming with the township's regulations, and so it's my recommendation that we, have, we approve... Um, uh, so moved. Second. Second. Um, Other discussion? Just a clarifying question. The, 
The one lot looks as if there is no road access. The blue there, lot. There is, because, but this is cut off. Okay. It, it, there's a second page, and this extends over. Fine. The okay. That was yeah. one of the only things that was confusing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, Set a date for a public hearing for a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance related to commercial wireless communication facilities. And this, these are the um, uh, many cell towers that we're, we're looking at regulating. The FCC has, um, in 2018, changed its rules with regard to this. Uh, we have drafted an ordinance um, to protect the township's interest, and we'd like to set the date of September 14th. Uh, so moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Aye. 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 I, I would like to make one comment, and, and this relates to uh, an email that I received from Mr. Berquist. You know, um, he has received a comment about uh, lack of cellular service in areas. I think right. we all experienced that in Peters Township. Yes. And and this, and we're going to talk about this when this ordinance comes comes through. But the thing to keep in mind is, you know, nobody wants a tower, but everybody wants their cell phone to work. And it really does become a balancing act. And when we have this ordinance in front of council, you need to think about that in terms of. But wouldn't there be a, a place in the a Peterswood or a Rolling Hills Park to put? Because that's where that McMurray area, you know, by the. Uh, there's they, yeah, there's a dead zone right there at Rolling Hills. Under our current regulations, the only places that you can build monopoles are in our light industrial zone. The thing you can do is co-locate on existing towers. And so what you see on top of in Giant Oaks, they, they went on one of the high tension yeah. towers and they have an antenna there. You could do that within the park, but as our regulations stand right now, you're not permitted to put up a monopole. Well, and so you know their preference is not to be co-located on those towers. Well, well we might want to we might want to revisit well Look, eventually 5G is coming, and we're going to have the 5G towers, which but, none of us want in our yards. But yeah. well, and again, we can't ordinance, stop that. This well, yeah, we're going to talk about this ordinance when it comes through, and it will have an impact on those towers. I don't know if anyone's seen what they look like, yeah. but but I, I I think though the problem with service is throughout the township. There's different pockets. Yeah. And even over in our area off of Bebot and Venetia, there are times when yeah. you lose. So yeah. well, I'm just mostly worried about my area. Yeah. I, I think well, be because it's all about you, sure. If there's, I think that the, the utility companies do have available, whether they publish them or not, uh, coverage maps. Uh, it would be good if you could distribute some of those to us and see where they are I, at the moment. Let me see whether I can get those from AT&T and Verizon. And then see what the coverage would be with these proposed uh, ordinances, you know, what, how they would propose addressing the, the, the holes that exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it might also if you could maybe send a couple articles that, that exist on on the 5G towers, what those things look like, and for some people that may not be familiar with it, because that will be the first time we have a meeting and present what that looks like and how they propose to go into neighborhoods. Um, we're going to have to have the auditorium. Yep. And we don't allow them in residential right now, according to the proposed ordinance. Under the proposed ordinance, you would not be able to build those in uh, residential areas where the utilities are underground. And again, the balancing act there is if you don't allow those in those areas, you will not have 5G service. Right. Thank you. Okay. So your autonomous car goes off the road. Wow. That's right. That's yeah. you. Or the trucks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ordinance uh, amending Peter's Township Code of Ordinances, repealing and replacing Section 44700, signage and public display. So we had presented this ordinance in a public hearing. Uh, council made a number of, of comments uh, with regard to um, uh, changes as well as the Planning Commission. We've incorporated those. Um, so one of the things the Planning Commission recommended that the uh, temporary signs for for lease properties be increased so that they're two foot tall and the width of a of whatever the monument or pole sign is and and we have done that um, at the uh, entrance to residential plans there was a question about could you have more than one monument sign the answer to that question is yes and then finally we had a discussion with regard to election signs and so what what the ordinance 
does and and i uh, believe um, having spoken with mr ball about this uh, extensively i think he's correct i don't think we have the ability to regulate um, election signs on private property uh, the only place where I do think you have some ability to regulate election signs is signs that appear in the right of way. So what this ordinance does, it exempts all election signs on private property. It establishes, like we do now, a period of time before an election and after an election that you can have them in the right of ways uh, and they need to be removed. So, so if I want to put a 20 by 20 sign in my front yard with lights all over and flickering, that's fine? Um, it's as long as it says vote for... No, actually what our ordinance says is that only signs that are required by the uh, either the uh, state of Pennsylvania or the Federal Election Board to have disclaimers on them are the signs that are unregulated. So if you want to put in, in your front yard, a sign that is of your own design, and it can say anything, it could be, you know, uh, vote for Paul, or it can make a, a, a statement about, you know, your neighbor or whatever it is, it's restricted to be two by three feet. We, uh, we had some extensive discussion with a couple of very knowledgeable election lawyers in Minnesota. They assured us that while we can't regulate election signs per se, uh, you can regulate them within reasonable. Um, you, know, you can't have a 20 foot by 30 foot sign, nor can you put one in a location in a yard where it blocks vision or right. safety for an equipment intersection. Uh, but, but that's all but, in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but you, you know, you should, you, you, you can drive around town, you know, you can go down uh, Bebop Road. There's a home there that has six selection signs and they're all 365 days a year, every year. <laughs> and so if you, want, yeah. if you want 50 signs in your yard, you can put yeah. them there. I mean, there's no law that prevents that, but they can't be, you know, extraordinarily large, nor can they be illuminated, nor can they, you know, nor can they, you know, contain comment that's objectionable. Uh, but if they have the, you know, the, the, the standard election disclaimer that they're sponsored by a, you know, recognized entity, then they're, they're legal. Okay. okay. Well, I'll move that we approve Ordinance 855, amending the Peters Township Code of Ordinances, repealing and replacing Section 44700 signage into public displays as presented. I'll second. Are there discussion? In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, award of a bid for the 2020 pavement rejuvenator project. So the Peters Township uh, 2020 budget contains an appropriation of $1,670,000 for the uh, 2020 road improvement program. Previously, we've awarded a contract for a little over $1,500,000 for resurfacing. Um, this, as a result, uh, there's $131,633, which has not yet been uh, spent from that appropriations. The proposed contract for the rejuvenator is $123,356. There, as in prior years, there was only one bid. Uh, it's my recommendation that the Peters Township Council award the bid for the 2020 pavement rejuvenator program, the pavement technologies in the amount of $123,356. So moved. Second. Discussion? In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Is there anything we could do to like generate more bids? I don't know that there's another competing uh, yeah, That's uh, kind of a proprietary item. Yeah, huh? It's kind of a proprietary item. I don't know whether it's regulated by distributors. Oh, okay. I don't know. Franchisees, I'm not sure if there's one bid. There's only one, you know, authorized distributor in the area that's this company out of Ohio. There's other places throughout here, some of the top and stuff, but they're too far away to get here. We've looked at other products, but this is the only one that you could drive on within a half hour. You know, the other rejuvenator sealer type products we've looked at, you have to shut down the road for 24 hours and let it cure, and that's just not feasible. Uh, so, okay. This is a good, good product. It serves us well. And it's, 
Okay, uh, uh, award of contract to uh, Kimmel Bogert for the design services related to the Rolling Hills Park Aquatic Center. Yeah. Council at the August 10th meeting authorized uh, my office to uh, attempt to negotiate a contract with uh, Kimmel Bogert for the design of the Rolling Hills Park Aquatic Center. I think we've been able to successfully do that. Um, they're proposing, as they, they showed in their um, response to the um, proposals to, to do a um, master concept plan and a business plan for a lump sum fee of $65,500 and then uh, the fee for the for the actual design of the aquatics facility would be done for 7.25% of the total construction costs. It's my recommendation we award a, uh, a contract to a Kindle Book Rec for design service related to the aquatic center. Well, how, how do they calculate the, the cost? Going to cost how much is going to cost them? Well, here, here we're going to do, and, and it's going to be at our choice. Um, they, they will uh, complete the design and, and prepare an estimate in house. Um, and um, we, in which case, um, we would hire a third party to verify what that that number is. The other alternative is to actually take the project out to bid and use whatever the construction price is. That comes as a result of the bid. Well, my, my question is, if you sign this contract, and you know we, get, we do, they do all the preliminary work, and then for some reason or not, we decide we're not going to put it out the bid. We're not going to build it. Are we obligated to give them money because we didn't go through with what? You you can terminate this contract at, at different stages. So um, it, one of the things uh, about this is. Uh, one of my initial questions to Martin Kimball was, if in fact we want to move ahead with this project, which may is it that we would be in a position to open up the pool? And, and, and so as a result of that, they put together a timeline. That timeline would have the pool opening on Memorial Day of 2022, but that's a very tight timeline. So what we would be doing is moving ahead with this this uh, business plan and this concept plan and also begin engineering work. So you can terminate this at any time, but you, what you would be responsible for is paying whatever they had done up to that point. If you take this the whole way to a complete design, you're responsible to pay for that complete design whether we build the pool at that moment or not. So that it would be through the design phase, but then Obviously, if it's not constructed, there would be no percent markup on the construction. There would no. You would pay at that point. You would pay seven and a quarter percent yeah, of whatever it is that they've designed. Yeah, what okay, you would well, not be incurring would be some sort of construction administration cost yeah. mm -hmm. for a project that's not built. So one of the questions, and I, one of them was what Mr. Curie asked, but I also wonder uh, a few things about the. Coordination, we are building the main road right now. The loop road has to be built. That's the second phase. You know, how is all of this going to dovetail together if, in fact, we would move forward? Well, um, right now, the, um, the loop road, um, the, the design is complete. Uh, it is sitting at the Washington County Conservation District um, uh, for review for permitting. Um, one of the things that they will be doing is providing a electronic copy of that, a CAD file, um, to um, uh, Kimball Barrett for the purposes of designing designing the uh, pool, so that you know you would coordinate the parking areas and that. So that's going to occur. Um, another question I had asked Mr. Lauer prior to the meeting. You know, I, I think if this comes to fruition, you know, we're, we're looking at a fee to them of $645,000 to $718,000 at the end of the day, if the budget is $8 million or $9 million. Um, I realize reimbursables is a standard part of AIA. I asked a little bit about that and whether we could try to um, control some of that. There was a clarifying point. Is it 5% or 10% or 5%. 15? Okay, because it was different in yes. different parts in the docket. I, I asked you that question. Yes. Right. You, you made me, when I got yours, I had to go look again. I had asked, when they originally bid it, they bid it at 15. 
I had suggested to them that that wasn't reasonable and that it should be five. He had suggested to me that 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 it be ten, and I thought that, in fact, what was what had been written in. But um, what's in the contract is five percent. And by engaging them, which is an outside of the local firm, we have already identified that there will be housing costs and other things, other reimbursables like that. But, but I would suggest to you that getting the right firm on a project of this size, you know, those, those costs will be inconsequential in, in relation to getting a good design. And, and that's to the people who are not in support of this, I don't think any of the costs are inconsequential. So that was one of the reasons I asked. Other comments? Questions? Okay. Uh, those in favor? I, yeah, I was going to propose a motion that we oh, okay. recognize it and uh, award the, the planning process for Rolling Hills Aquatic Park Center. Okay. I'll second. All right, we've seconded anything. Other questions? In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Abstain? We have 421. 421. Four okay. All right. Um, uh, council representatives to the um, Drilling Hills Park Aquatic Center Committee. So, um, like I said, um, so they, uh, they're anxious to get going on this because they, they believe that, that, that if, in fact, we're going to move ahead with this for next construction season, um, they need direction from us. And so uh, this Saturday, they would like to engage us uh, here um, with, uh, and, and uh, attempt to provide some direction. And so um, they have suggested that we put together a design committee um, what I have recommended that, and, and their preference of the committee not be overly large, um, that we have a committee that would consist of representatives from the Park and Rec Board. Uh, they've already appointed uh, members, that we have three members from council, and then you would also have uh, uh, members of the township staff. Okay. We, uh, we received a uh, call put out a uh, notice to see who was interested in serving on this, this group. Uh, we received five responses of people who were interested. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my duty to appoint three people. Uh, I've chosen to represent council in this, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Kozer, and Mr. Curry. Uh, I'm not going to do it. I, I don't want to accept that. So I would suggest that you appoint someone else. I'll take it. Okay, I just don't have the time. I'm not available this weekend, and I don't. Quite frankly, I'm, I've had it with this whole process. Okay. I think we're spending a lot of money that could be spent elsewhere on a better project. And uh, we'll put this for uh, purpose. Okay. Frank, I, I know you're frustrated, and I know that you probably have a different perspective. But I have to say that it's been a quarter of a century that I've been an advocate of this community moving forward I, into an aquatic well, center. I'm not opposed to, to having some sort of a pool and aquatic center. My, my position all along has been that for the money that we're paying for this asset, all the money that we're paying to, to, to do this, um, and with, with an uncertainty of what's going on in the, in the world today, with the uncertainty of whether we're even going to be able to break even on the operating costs, uh, versus and, and, and have an asset that we can use for maybe three or four months a year, I would rather spend that money. I mean, for, for the money that we're going to spend on this, we could build probably the rest of the projects in the park. And there's no risk that any of that's going to, you know, lose money or it's going to cost a ton of money 15 years now to, to, to fix it. I, I'm not opposed to that. It's just, it's the unknown of spending eight, well, probably by the time we're done, $10 million. I mean, that's a lot of money for an asset that you're going to use th three or four years, three or four months a year. And, and, and I agree, we should have something. And, and I, would, I wouldn't be opposed to doing something. I, I just can't see spending that kind of money 
for, for the Taj Mahal of, if, if you don't know if you're going to make money, then you might as well just build a pool with whatever normal people build and, and, and just supplement it with tax dollars every year for a couple hundred thousand or whatever it is, and, and you're going to lose money. But for $10 million, you could probably do almost every other improvement in the park that's on the, that's on the plan as opposed to this. And, and that, that's my big, big beef about this. I mean, I don't have a problem if you want to make a, 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 a pool or an aquatic component, but I mean, to spend that kind of money, I, I, I just don't think that's fiscally prudent. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I don't know how much is going to get used. I mean, I go on to Rose Garden like you do, and, and I mean, I, I know down there, and, and usually in July and August, there's nobody there. I don't it's been know, operating this summer in the midst of COVID. Well, that I mean, I'm just saying that, but in the past. With regulations and restrictions and, and people. Are right. And I'm not opposed to it. I mean, I think, I think we should have some. If that's, you know, I think we have, to, we have to have something for everyone. But to spend $10 million for well, that. We've already made it 10 We don't know what it's going Yeah, we don't know if it's 10 Well, I think the cost here is eight, eight, eight or $9 million. All right. Plus, what are, we, what are we paying for this? 65 And How much have we spent to date? We can be up. It's, we're going to pay, spend, spend almost 700000 on this particular company to do that. And I, I have to say I agree with Mr. Curie, and I think that whoever's on the do design committee needs to recognize that there are a lot of people in the community who are not in favor of the pool and that we don't really need. And there's a lot of people in this township that are much in favor of the pool. Well, Mr. Burquist, yeah. that's probably true. But again, that survey was done before the pandemic. And I think that if you read the survey, you'll realize that those people, the action that they're projecting, they saying they would do, is not necessarily what does come to fruition when the rubber hits the road. And my concern is that that $10 million could do a lot more for infrastructure improvements than a pool. So I just, it behooves you who are now on the design committee to be aware, in my opinion, that we need to manage that design. Okay, Crawford, I know everybody's made their point and their valid points and value the comments, but uh, we'll see what happens here. Okay. Um, next item is payroll and bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I reviewed the payroll and bills last week. Uh, in addition, there was an additional run that was given to council tonight with other checks. Many of those and some of the ones on the prior run were capital improvements that we have committed to. Um, we also are buying our final ration of salt this year. Um, the credit card statement is in the docket. Uh, you saw it when I saw it. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Lauer on that? If not, I'll make a motion that we approve the payroll and bills as submitted. Second. Uh, discussion in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Okay. Correspondence and uh, reports. Anybody want to discuss any of the reports? Okay, miscellaneous. A couple things. Um, there, uh, just so everyone knows, apparently the church where that held the polling place for District B1 had uh, indicated that they were no longer interested in doing that. Uh, we've talked with, with the Election Bureau. We're going to uh, do that um, right here on this campus in the community room, and that can be the permanent home for the uh, people in B1. Where's the polling place now for B1? It is Peter's over at. Peters Creek. Yeah, Peters Creek. Presbyterian. Yeah. So the, this is in the district. Okay. So they decided not to continue. Um, on the Saturday, uh, Ryan and I did initial interviews with candidates for the library director's position. Um, we're of the opinion that there are two of those individuals who are um, worthy of a second interview. The library board is going to do an inter a Zoom interview with them. On Thursday, I was hoping uh, to have uh, council do an interview on Monday night uh, next week, since we don't have a meeting uh, with funny. those two candidates. In person or is it? In person. That's fine. Okay. Um, I had a question, Mr. Well, can I ask this? Oh, Am sure. I assuming Sorry. that they need to be at 7:30, or can they be at 7 o'clock? 
start at seven. Seven's yeah. fine. I, I know Mr. Woods sometimes has a problem with that. I don't know of a problem, so. Okay. So. Okay. I'm sorry, you had Maple Lane also. Never mind. Um, well, actually, I wanted to, uh, we actually have some good news. So our health care renewal, uh, once again, and I'm not quite sure how this is possible, but our, um, our health care for our employees is being renewed at no increased cost again this year. So um, I, I don't know how, at some point, this is going to come back and get us. Um, Mr. Ball had asked uh, me to add on to your concern about uh, Maple Lane uh, traffic. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Ball? Um, some of you that drive out in the, uh, well, it's the, actually the A1 district where I am, but Maple Lane goes off of 19 and goes down the big hill, you know, down toward Han Road. Uh, it's a steep hill. Was down there some time ago, uh, several months ago, I guess. Uh, uh, North Bain paved Han Road. It used to be a gravel yeah, it's road. Really nice. Road. It's very nice right now, except that it's very windy and very narrow and very steep off the sides. But anyhow, it's become a very popular cut through for people from 79. We uh, don't want to go up to uh, to. Uh, Route 19, and a number of the people that live on Maple Lane are complaining that, that there's some pretty rapid traffic going up and down that hill, particularly down that hill. Don't we already have speed bumps up there? No. no. Or they stop up at the top of Maple Lane? Yeah. Well, there's a couple at the top, but right. there's nothing going down the hill. I'm not sure that's a place you want to put speed right. bumps. Uh, uh, I would suggest that maybe our traffic community or somebody might want to look at that. Uh, it, Probably is a candidate for some of those, uh, you know, speed indicators. Um, maybe we want to try that. But uh, more to the point is that this is a road and an area when that new uh, highway is completed. Um, there's going to be a lot of traffic in this area, and when you come up. When you go up Maple Lane and try and get out onto 19 from Maple Lane, that is a terrible intersection. You can't you can't get out onto 19 even with minor traffic and with heavy traffic, it's almost impossible. Yeah, if you're trying to make a left turn. If you're trying to make right. a left turn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we need to think about what we're going to do there. When when you um, had sent me an email, you included pictures of trucks on that road. Um, I had a chance to talk to Mr. Mudry. One of the things that we can do is, based upon his observation, you can actually um, eliminate truck traffic on that road if he determines that that um, is what is warranted. So, for instance, on Thompsonville Road, because of that sharp bend, uh, Mr. Mudry was willing to give us uh, a professional opinion that we could limit that. I'm going to have him take a look at Maple Lane to see whether we can yeah. do the same there. I, I think that, that yeah, that would make some sense because, you know, that's the, the truck traffic is going to be what's going to find that as an attractive shortcut. And I can't imagine a truck going down the paved portion of uh, Pond Road. And it really it is narrow and windy. And if the truck goes off the edge of that thing, it's going to end up upside down. I, I think they should make they, they can do some speed counts there. Yeah. Speed count in a uh, that's a, that's a Ryan thing. That's a Ryan thing, you know. <laughs> but uh, but uh, trucks and come, I mean, coming down that hill, you know, that's that's probably one of the steeper hills in the township. Uh, it's the longer, steeper hill. And there there is concern, and the people that live on there, the two of them have farms that could extend on both sides of the road. And uh, I've seen them walking horses across the road and things like that, so it's a, it is a problem. But I'm more, I'm more concerned, well, I'm concerned with that, but I'm more concerned when we start to see additional traffic from the new road. I have no idea what's going to happen. I think a lot of GPSs will send you up that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else well, next meeting? Following up on the question of traffic, a while back, we asked about the speed limit on Bebout changing from 25 to 35. A resident had asked whether we might yeah. inquire. I, I don't know whether we got a response on that. We, we, we have not gotten a response. We did send a letter to Brian Walker and Dr. 
Okay. If you could follow up at some point. Thank you. Do you have an update on just in general about that pooch pit issue? Still, the there's still an issue there. We actually, from the perspective of the residents, they believe there's an issue there. We actually do not think that it is currently in violation of our ordinance. Um, so um, I, I don't know what's going to occur there. You know, they had talked about putting up sound walls and the neighbors objected and um, they decided not and, and took them to court to stop them from doing that. So Hooch Pit took the position, we'll do other things to control the noise. And we think they have done that. And they've provided us with um, reports that, that demonstrate that. So I, I don't know what's going to happen there. Is there an appeal or something? No, they actually, that the case is completely gone because Pooch uh, said, you know, we're not going to, we won't build the walls. We'll, we'll, we'll find a different way to mitigate the problem, and we think they have. So. Okay, thank you. Barkless dogs. <laughs> <laughs> More dogs inside is what it turns out to be. All righty. Um, nothing for next agenda. Um, I did have a question. We've just appointed someone for Peters Township Sanitary, but we have two other boards who need members, yes. Youth Commission and EQB. We're, uh, with those? We're, we're working on that. Okay, okay. so we would potentially have those yeah. on the next, one of the next two. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, there being nothing else and no executive session? Well, actually, if I could just have your attention for about uh, two minutes in an executive session, something came up since we did this. Alrighty, we have a short executive session then. Other than that, we are adjourned.